our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, God's grace, mercy, and peace are with all of you. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ our Savior, God sends different people into our lives to bless us in different ways. Martin Luther had a very interesting perspective on this. Luther said that God masks himself to intervene with humankind and to bless us. Really an interesting concept. God wants us to know him and he wants to bless us, but he can't just come to us in all of his power and glory. As sinful human beings, we could never stand before a holy God. It would literally kill us. So the mind-boggling reality is that when God wants to reveal himself to us, he does it by hiding himself. When God wants to bless us, he comes to us with his power and grace hidden by masking himself in other people. Right? God masks himself when he sends doctors and nurses into our lives to help take care of our physical needs and help us to be healthy physically. God masks himself when he sends a financial planner to help us manage the, the money he's so graciously given to us. God masks himself when he sends the garbage man to collect our garbage. and When he sends the, the mail carrier to, to bring us our mail, God masks himself in the, the teacher as he sends that teacher to help us grow in our wisdom and knowledge so we succeed in this world. God masks himself in different people to bless us in different ways. Well, today God focuses our attention on those he sends into our lives to bring us the greatest blessings. You know, all the earthly possessions that we have, all the, the material blessings God has given to us are certainly gracious gifts from him. But even unbelievers and pagans receive those blessings from God. Even if we were to have more than anyone, we... They still wouldn't help us to stand before God. And so the greatest blessing that we could have is being able to stand before Almighty God in peace. And it is the forgiveness of sins that Jesus won on Calvary's cross and the salvation that he brings to us through faith which gives us that peace to stand before God without fear. So what a blessing that God would send people into our lives to share his word with us. Through those people and the message that they bring, God brought us to faith. And he strengthens us in our faith. And he continues to guide us in our faith as he leads us on that path that leads to eternal life. Last week as we gathered for worship, we spent our time focusing on just thanking God for the blessing of, of sending someone into our life to share His Word with us. Today God focuses our attention, our, our attention on that response to that message. He wants us to, to ponder how we respond to the message that His messengers bring. Thank God masks himself and his messengers to guide and equip us with the peace we need eternally and to equip us with all that we need to serve him while we're here on this earth. Recognizing those great blessings, we want to respond in gladness and joy by listening to them and, and following them. Because in the end, what they bring to us are not their words, they are God's. Let's keep that thought in our mind as we turn to our text for today. It's from Hebrews chapter 13, verses 7 and 8, and then verses 17 to 21. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority. 
because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. Pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. I particularly urge you to pray so that I may be restored to you soon. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So far the words of our text. Now, peace was not what these Christians who received this letter were experiencing when it was written. The recipients of this letter were, were Jewish or, or Hebrew Christians who were living in Rome. And while they hadn't yet faced uh, persecution that, uh, that was of a violent nature, they were facing some, some pretty difficult challenges. They were being mocked by the Romans because of their beliefs. And in addition, they were also facing ridicule from their their Jewish uh, fellow Jews because they believed in Jesus. Many of them were tempted to hide their faith, to not have to face that kind of ridicule, and, and no doubt many of them had. Some were even tempted to give up their faith so as to avoid any further hassle or trouble. This entire letter was written to encourage these believers to keep their eyes fixed on Jesus so that they could stand firm and persevere through the challenges that they faced. And the author did that by reminding them of the reward that was waiting for them. Reminding them what it is that they would give up if they would give up their faith. They would be giving up Jesus and giving up heaven. So chapter 11, he recalled for them all of their forefathers, what many have called the great heroes of faith. All of those heroes of faith, men like Noah and Abraham and Moses and David, all of them faced tremendous persecution and, and opposition as they sought to follow God's will and serve Him with their lives. Yet all of them persevered through those challenges. They stood firm. They kept their eyes fixed on Jesus and they received the gift of eternal life that, that God so graciously gave them. Now with all that in mind, the author starts our text by encouraging them to remember the leaders who had shared God's word with them. You see, while those great heroes of faith would be known through the stories that were told about them, they wouldn't have been known personally to these Christians. But the leaders who had first shared God's word with them were personally known to them. They could readily identify with them and their story. Maybe it was their parents who would be a leader who shared God's word with them. Or maybe an elder in the church. Or, or, or one of the leaders who was very influential over the group. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. And then with that in mind, he goes on in his encouragement. Consider the outcome of their way of life. In other words, think about where they ended up when life was over. And this is more than just saying, think about where their life went. It really takes them to the final outcome of their life. So that as these believers scan carefully the faithful life and the, the fearless death these Christians had lived, they would strengthen the weak Christians, and the strained Christians, Christians would be warned. Whether their death had come from being martyrs because of their faith, or if it, they had died of natural causes, the fact that they had fallen asleep in Jesus would be very influential, even especially as they were facing persecution. So remember your leaders, consider the outcome of their way of life, and then imitate them. They had stood firm and true to Christ 
despite the challenges they faced. They didn't waver in their faith or, or weaken as those challenges came their way. They stood firm. They focused on Christ and they too are receiving the reward that God promised for all who believe in Him. Now here's his point. While those leaders may be gone, the message they preached was not. Even though they might have new leaders now, the message was Christ's and was eternally the same. <clears throat> what Christ had done for believers in the past, he would continue to do for believers in the present. The winds of the earth may shift the sand, the, the winds of time may shift the sand of the earth, but it could do nothing to the eternal Savior. He's always the same. He never changes in his care for his people or the way that he looks after them. So believers of every century have but one ground for their faith and one purpose in their life, and that's Jesus Christ. And so he could further his encouragement by saying, now submit yourself to those who are sharing God's word with you now, those who are, are leading you right now. Because those who were true teachers of the word and staunch confessors of Christ were worthy of obedience and submission. They were God's gift. God was masking himself in these leaders to bring his message of divine peace through Jesus. These leaders weren't coming to further their own personal agendas or with their own hope for glory. They weren't speaking to try and prop themselves up and make themselves look great. They were simply there sharing the message God himself had given. God had masked himself in these leaders to equip them with his peace and to guide and direct them as they continue to go through their life. And so the Christians really weren't submitting to their leaders as much as they were submitting to God. Because these were God's words. You know, people in our day have a little bit of a hard time with leadership. Maybe that's because we've had so many leaders in the past who have, have failed us and haven't given us proper guidance and direction. I mean, I think about the way that most Americans will, will look at their government leaders. One of the reasons might be because all of them seem to make great, big, grand promises that they, they not only don't intend to keep, but couldn't possibly keep. You start to wonder who you can trust. But it's not just government leaders that people don't trust. You find people who don't trust parents or, or teachers or principals because they don't want anyone else telling them what to do. They want to do their, their own thing. You find that many will feel this way about employers or, or bosses or, or managers. So maybe we have a hard time with the message God shares with us today when he says have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority. But let's just remember a couple of things. Let's remember first of all that anyone in authority over us is God's representative that he sends to bring a blessing to us. Even if they fail us at times. And even if they operate in ways that are different from the way that we would do that, he still wants us to honor and respect them. That's a fourth commandment issue. But then let's remember the added blessing that God brings through those whom he sends to be his messengers. They are bringing God's word. We listen to them. Pray for them. Imitate their faith and follow them because they are bringing to us the words... God himself has said. When I stand before you and read God's word, it is really as if God himself were standing here sharing that message with you. No, I'm not calling myself God. And I'm not comparing myself to him in any sort of way. Just recognizing the great privilege of, of sharing with you words that are God's words. Urging you to believe those words, not because I say them, but because... God said them. You know, that really reminds us of the, the huge responsibility I have on my shoulders as pastor. 
This passage reminds me that one day I will stand before God to give an account for the way that I shepherded you as his representative. And for the message I proclaimed to you as his messenger. This reminds me of the awesome responsibility I have of proclaiming God's word in all of its truth. Please know as your pastor, I take that very seriously. So when I talk about sin, I don't do it because I enjoy watching you squirm, or to control your life, or to talk down to you in any way. I, I do that because that's what God himself said. And when I talk about the death and the hell that we deserve because of that sin, I don't do that to, to try and rule you with fear or be heavy-handed. Those are words God himself has said. God's the one who sets the rule for what is sin and what isn't sin. It's not for us to change that. We couldn't even if we tried. And God's the one who set death as the, 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 the payment that we deserve for the sins that we commit. I share that word with you to help you recognize your sin and to know what you deserve so you can turn from that sin to the solution that God himself provided in Jesus. So when I share with you the, the forgiveness that Jesus offers through his life, death, and resurrection, it's not that I'm just being soft or letting you off the hook. That's what God himself said. And when I share with you, because of, of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, heaven is open and God is waiting to welcome all who believe in him. It's not that I'm making some promise I may or may not be able to deliver on. That's what God himself said. When I share with you that no matter how big of a sin you've committed, no matter how many times you've done it or how long you've been committing it, that it's forgiven in Jesus. I'm not just making a wish or offering some false hope. That's what God himself has said. Listen to that message. Trust it. Put your faith in it. Not because I said it, because those are God's words. I mean, just think about what kind of peace it brings to you to know that those are God's words. That means I'm not up here saying, well, you might be forgiven, or I think you got a pretty good chance of heaven if you keep going on the path you're on, or, or God would seem pretty favorable. This is God saying, when you confess your sin, He is faithful and just and will forgive that sin. This is God saying, whoever believes in me will live with me eternally. So we can stand up here and confidently say, you are right with God. You have forgiveness for your sins. It can be absolutely confident of your salvation. Not because I said it, but because God himself has said that. God just masked himself and me to be able to share that message with you. It's the same thing when I tell you that now as God's children, as you leave his house of worship today, you have the great privilege of going out to use all of the time and the talents and the treasures that you have to further his kingdom and carry out his work. They don't talk to you about offering so I can build my own kingdom. I don't urge you to, to use your abilities and your talents to serve one another with God's word because I'm pushing my own big agenda so I can pack my resume for some time in the future. I don't urge you to use your time to, to serve God and, and to proclaim his word to other people to put a feather in my own cap. Those are God's words. That's what God wants for you. I share that simply because I want you to be able to honor God in the way that you live and, and follow His will. I want to be able to help you say thanks to God for all that He's done for you in Jesus. And give you that great privilege of going out and using what God has given you to carry out the work that God wants each one of us to be carrying out, which is to be His witnesses to our world. God masks Himself in different people to bring different blessings into our lives. Well, he wants us to honor all of who are in authority, be especially thankful for those God sent to, to, to share his word and, and ponder your response to that message. Honor them.
listen to them, respond by following that message, trust it and take it to heart. Because they don't come to you for their good or their own benefit. God sends them for your benefit. And God sends them to you. Not with their words, but with God's words. Maybe treasure that word. And be thankful to God that He continues to guide and direct us and equip us for service now and with His peace eternal. Amen.